This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. David Thornburg invented the Koala Pad, a touch tablet that was available for the Atari 8-Bit computers, Commodore 64, Apple II, and the IBM PC. A version for the TRS-80 color computer was also available, which was sold as the TRS-80 touchpad. He is also the author of the Koala Pad book, which was published in 1984. This interview took place on May 22, 2017. In it, we discuss George White, the founder of Koala Technologies, whom I previously interviewed. I was just waiting for you for the call to start, and I was looking at your your book. Oh, the, yeah. And I happened it happened this. It says uh, yesterday, thirty four years ago yesterday, uh, Koala Pad appeared on the shelves of uh, computer stores in the San Francisco Bay Area, May twenty first, nineteen eighty three. It says. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Long time. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Yes. Oh, it sure does. <laughs> All right. So um, I would like to start before the beginning. Um, I, I, I talked to George the other day and kind of got his perspective and um, okay. a little disappointed we couldn't all find time to do it together, but that's OK. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is uh, you invented Koala Pad when you were at Xerox Park. Right. They didn't, they didn't really want it. And they let you do your own thing with it. So I'd like to hear that from from your perspective, kind of your you start as far back as you need to, where the idea came from, whatever you need to tell me to give me the run up, okay. please. All right. Well, um, I the original invention was in 1973, uh, and I was at Park, and among other projects, well, to start with, I started at Xerox Park in 1971, February 1st, 1971, and uh, I got introduced to uh, a guy whose office was right across the hall from me, uh, and his name was George White, and he and I became fast friends um, from, from 1971 on. And after a few years, he left uh, Xerox Park and started a speech recognition company. And then uh, he, he went off with, with his life, and I stayed at Park. Uh, and in 73, I was working on a project where we had already done the graphical user interface and things like that on a machine called the Alto. And I wanted to do a, a touch a screen interface for it <clears throat> instead of, of working with the mouse. And so the mouse had been invented at Stanford Research Institute and had been brought over to Xerox Park along with a couple of people from there. And I, th I thought it's not natural to work with this with this rock-like object, um, and the natural thing for people to do is to draw with a pen. And digitizing uh, technologies at the time were amazingly expensive, and I came up with something that was very inexpensive <clears throat> and built it and tried to get Xerox to pay attention to it. And we even had a, uh, we had an artist in residence who did some neat things. And he did a quick little internal ad. He was a big guy and he got dressed up as a, um, uh, in, in like a tiger skin um, outfit. And he looked at the camera and he held up a stone that he had uh, a, a piece of wire dangling out of. It was to represent a mouse. And he said, for thousands of year, men draw with rock, but now men draw with stick. And, and he held up a stylus for the, for the tablet that I did. <laughs> and it was so hysterical. And I wish that I had a copy of that video, but I don't. But in any event, uh, the corporation, um, they were certainly happy for me to do that work, but they didn't want to do anything with it, didn't want to commercialize it. So we fast forward to 1981, uh, and I decided I was going to leave Xerox Park because uh, I had done uh, a lot there, and and I wanted to you know just pursue some of my own ideas. 
And one of them was to continue on with this tablet concept. And I asked Xerox, I said, uh, I said, why aren't you doing anything with this technology? And they said, because we don't see this being more than a $150 million a year business. <clears throat> and so it's not worth it for us to invest in it. And I thought, well, you know, $150 million may not mean much to you, but, you know, to me, that would be pretty nice. You could probably right? squeak, squeak by with that, right? <laughs> so I said, well, I tell you what, I said, I'd like a license on this technology. And they said, uh, oh, great, we'll give it to you. And I said, well, draft up the license and tell me what royalties you want if I commercialize this. And they said, oh, there's no need for royalties. Um, as far as we're concerned, you can just have it. Well, and I'd left the company on very good terms. So this wasn't like I was being forced out or anything. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll accept that. So um, I left I left Xerox. I did some consulting for Atari. I did some consulting for Apple. I did a little bit of work for a bunch of people. And then George White called again. And I hadn't talked with him since the mid-70s. Uh, well, I think we stayed in touch a bit, but we hadn't really talked too much about business. And he said, I just sold my company and I don't know what uh, I don't know what to do. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, I, I want to start another company. But he said, I don't know what to make. So I said, George, stay, hang up the phone. Don't answer it. Stay there. I'll be right over. And I ran into the garage, pulled out my prot prototype tablet and uh, tossed at that time. It was an Apple II <laughs> in the back of the car and drove over to his house and uh, long story short, the next day he filed papers to start what ended up becoming uh, Koala Technologies. And so uh, we got some uh, we got some investors and and we did a uh, we did the product and we did several versions. We did one for Apple. We did uh, uh, one for Atari. We did one for, I think, Commodore 64. And uh, ultimately, in 1984, uh, we did one for the Macintosh also. So we, uh, we built that company up. And at one point, I think we had close to 200 people working in the factory. We had a, you know, it was a great operation in the, in the Bay Area. And I felt, uh, you know, really happy, uh, as did George, because when you've, when you've invented something that allows other families to put food on their table and, and uh, whatnot, that's a contribution and, it, and it's just fun. And I've realized that having worked for a Fortune 500 company, that where my heart was was with startups, with small companies. And it's still that way today. I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing now in a minute. But, uh, but anyhow, that's, that's how the company got going. And I uh, remember uh, when we started shipping product, we put it, uh, we, we got, uh, I think it was the bite shop in, in Palo Alto or Mountain View, one of those two cities, uh, where I did a demonstration of the koala pad. And, and again, this was in, uh, you know, 80, 83, I don't remember exactly when, well, you've got the date cause it's on the book, but in any event, back in those days and people said, why on earth would I want to draw pictures on a computer screen? <laughs> and people don't ask those questions today, but in those days, that was a big deal. And what I liked about the Atari uh, machine was that unlike the other computers on the market, excepting for the Amiga, uh, it had a separate processor for graphics. Um, and, and as you know, the Atari was really ahead of its time in, in, in that regard. And uh, so you could do very rich things graphically with that machine that weren't possible with uh with other computers in that price range um, and and so that was a that was a huge plus for us uh, 
And I, so, and I very much enjoyed that. Um, and, and also because the Atari had, uh, as I recall, had four inputs, uh, along the front. Um, if I wanted to, I could put in four tablets and I mean, it, couldn't come up with a really well actually i did design we never commercialized it but i did design a game a two-player um ge geometry game that um uh, but um didn't do anything with that uh, but in any event that's that's it and the product ended up in places like toys r us and and other big retailers and I rode that uh, elevator, George and I rode it up to the top and all the way back down again, because that sometimes happens uh, with, with small companies. But the most important thing to me was it cemented a really warm relationship between George and myself. Um, and, you know, he now is a professor at Carnegie Mellon at their campus in Doha, Qatar. And I'm here in the U.S., and we still chat every couple of weeks. And it's it's like it's like nothing uh, has ever interfered with that with that relationship. And and that's neat. Um, he and I have truly become lifelong friends. And and this business the experience of creating business together with him was certainly a highlight of my life and what i'm doing now kevin just to give you a quick update is Please. um i'm director of education for another startup uh, not one that i started but i was brought into uh, called polar 3d who does uh, uh, 3D printers for the education market. And what makes them unique is that everything's cloud-based so that I can run a print job from, from any device I, that has a browser in it. And uh, for example, I'm here in California right now, but uh, my home is near Chicago. And if I want to uh, print something, that'll be ready when I get home uh, tomorrow afternoon, I can start the print job right from my iPhone. And I can, because there's a camera in the printer, I can even take a look and see how it's doing. Uh, and and that's that's wow. really cool. So, um, so anyway, I'm having a blast and not making the kind of money I'd be making with an equivalent position in a large company. But I don't care about that. What I care about is I'm working with really cool people on really nifty projects and that I get to help shape what the company looks like. And and because I did that at Koala. And once you've done that, um, it, it it's in your blood and you just never get away from it. Hmm. Nice. It, it feels to me that the, the 3D printers are going to could change the world like the the computer with the mouse did. I mean, it could be that big. I agree. I agree. And and we're seeing that. And I'll tell you there uh, to start with every jet engine um, in in use today has th uh, 3D printed turbine blades in it because those blades have special cooling um, uh, jets in them that can't be machined in. They have to be built in uh, in the process of manufacturing the blades because the blades are actually, the gas around the blades is hotter than the melting point of, of the metal. And so those jets keep the blades from overheating. Uh, and there's never been a failure on a jet engine of a 3D printed part. The failures have always happened at welds. And so companies like GE and, and Rolls-Royce, I'm sure, but GE for sure, is uh, doing everything they can to reduce the number of welds in a jet engine uh, just to make the engine safer. Uh, the other area that's having a huge impact uh, right now uh, because of 3D printing is medicine. And not only are there people walking around with 3D printed discs, uh, they're uh, working on knees uh, and, and other load-bearing uh, uh, body parts. 
There's uh, 3D printed bladders in some people. And uh, there's a, a research team at Johns Hopkins uh, that also works out of the country of Chile that is working on kidneys. They've got them working in rabbits now, and the human trials will be starting soon. And they use cells from the patient's own body, so there's no rejection. And and so medicine is changing tremendously wow. because wow. of 3D printing. Uh, and that doesn't even touch on the bulk of the 3D printing stuff, which is uh, prototypes and, 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 of course, the education side of things, uh, uh, 3D printed uh, materials for different types of experiments that kids would do in school and so on. So it's, a, uh, it's definitely a new industrial revolution, and it's just getting started, and it's, and it's so much fun to, to be working in that, in that field. My wife and I wrote the first book on 3D printing and education a few years back, and, and everything in that book is so out of date now because the field moves so fast, uh, but it's a, it's a dynamic and exciting field. Nice. Well, this is not as you know important as 3D printing a, a new bladder, but in my space of people who use retro computing and uh, you know use old Apple IIs and Ataris right. and things, when when a, a part breaks on your old computer that because the the plastic got brittle after 35 years, yeah, just reprint a new one and works that's great. It. <laughs> people have do that regularly, so that's pretty awesome. Um, all right, I'd like to go back to inventing the koala pad uh, i'd like to uh, my vague question is i mean how how did you invent it where did the idea come from and how did you start piecing things together and tell me about when it went ah this works for the first time yeah well basically the idea was that uh i'd, I'd taken a look at digitizers those were tremendously expensive and amazingly accurate machines that used very complex uh, physics to, to take a, a physical position and convert it into machine-readable data. And I thought, well, you know what? A potentiometer, um, uh, when you measure the rotation on a potentiometer, um, it's, 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 that's a very simple piece of technology that tells you something about position and in that particular case, rotationally. So I was just noodling around with ideas and it occurred to me that if I took two uh, resistive sheets, uh, at that time I was using uh, uh, plastic covered with uh, tin oxide, which is transparent uh, resistive material. Uh, because the original tablets that we made went over a CRT, and uh, and so if I took if I took one of them and I had uh, bus bars on the uh, vertical edges, and then I had a second sheet that faced it, uh, but had bus bars on the horizontal edges, then if if I pressed it so that it made contact. And then I put a voltage across one sheet and use the, um, the, the others as the wiper part of a potentiometer, let's say. That would tell me, for example, the horizontal position. And then if I reverse that process and put the voltage across the other sheet, uh, the top one, for example, and then use the bottom sheet as the wiper, that would tell me the y-axis. And so it was very simple. It was like having two potentiometers with a sh uh, shared wiper, um, and that you used your your finger to to do that. And well, if you do that a thousand times a second, um, and have uh, an eight bit uh, analog digital converter, uh, now suddenly you've got. Um, a, a tablet with a resolution of uh, 256 um, uh, bits, no, not 256 bits, 256 uh, pixels, let's say, on, on each axis, which was certainly close enough for uh, the moving a cursor around on a screen. And if you take a look at the tablets that you use when you sign a, uh, a credit card uh, slip at the grocery store, 
that's exactly how they work. It's a resistive uh, touch tablet, and it uses my patent. Um, I don't get any royalties on it because the patent's long expired, but that's that's how it works. And um, if you look at that from just the right angle, in fact, you can see those that there's these horizontal and vertical uh, silver uh, uh, bars on on the tablet that uh, <laughs> where the where the voltage is put across. So um, that and and the goal was to do something to not build a digitizing tablet, but to build a pointing device. And so I didn't need ultra high resolution and accuracy. All I needed was something that could be used either with a stylus or with a finger. Uh, now, I wish, in retrospect, that I'd invented the capacitive touch screen because that's the one that's used today, but I happen to be the inventor of the resistive one. Uh, but it showed up after Koala went away. It showed up in the Apple Newton. It showed up in the Palm. Uh, it showed up in a lot of devices all the way up to um, – by the time we got to the world of smartphones and, and iPads and whatnot, they'd already switched to uh, capacitive. So that was um, so that was the the breakthrough there. That's the physics of the device. It's it's uh, it's one of those uh, slap on the side of the head type inventions that becomes obvious in retrospect. <laughs> but uh, our patents were were quite broad. Um, one of the one of the challenges that we had and solved was uh, you want those uh, sheets as close together as possible, but not touching. So what we did was we had screen printed some insulating dots uh, on the surface of one of the sheets, so that when the sheets were together they weren't making electrical contact. You had to push, you know, to make that happen. And we got a patent on that. So uh, we ended up getting some good coverage on that uh, technology. And when the company shut down, all of that got sold off to uh, 3M, hmm. who was the only company I know of who's still making <laughs> resistive uh, touch tablets. Huh. Interesting. Um, George seemed disappointed that the Koala Pad ended up only being used uh, only for education. It didn't get picked up in business. It was like became like a kids thing. Did did you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, both of us felt that it had far more potential than it, um, than it seemed to uh, achieve. Uh, I mean, it was an uphill battle. Um, as, as I told you, the first time I demonstrated this in public, there were people who, who said, why on earth would I want to draw pictures on a computer? And so educating, edu educating the customer base when you've got a brand new invention, um, that's tricky. And, and, uh, and it was not something that either of us expected. I mean, it, it was in our mind, as soon as we put this thing out, people would just go nuts for it. Um, and they didn't. And so, uh, and it's not that we didn't try, but it just, you know, it just didn't have the, didn't have the impact that it, that it could have had. Um, so yeah, that, that part was frustrating. And then the other part that was frustrating was, um, that we had for a variety of reasons, uh, uh run out of money and, <clears throat> And so the company, the venture capitalists came in and <clears throat> um, took the company apart. And in fact, I can I can share with you a little story about that. Uh, well, what when the uh, when when the take apart team came in, uh, the guy in charge of all that uh, 
sent us home. And, and I mean, the company was still running, but George and I were out. <clears throat> and neither George nor I wanted to be CEO of the company. We had a, an outsider who was uh, a couple of them that we'd brought in over the years to uh, run the company for us. And, uh, and that's a critical hire. Um, and we did get it right, but we got it right late. And by that time it was too late. So when the company got uh, sold out from under us, this guy shows up and he said, what are you still doing here? And I said, well, I said, you may not be paying me anymore, but I said, this is still, uh, I said, there's a whole bunch of people back there who are, uh, still working um, because of one of my inventions and I'm going to stay there and provide them any support I can. And he said, he said, well, he said, I want your key. I said, well, you can have my key. I said, uh, I'm sure that somebody will give me another one before I leave today. So nice. uh, that's fine. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, I'll call the police. And I said, you do that. I said, uh, uh, while you call the police, I said, I'll call the San Jose Mercury News and uh, uh, newspaper and see who gets here first and whatnot. And I said, you know, I said, let me tell you what your problem is. You know how to take things apart. Good for you. But you've never built anything in your entire life. You have no idea what it's like to invent something that has generated livelihood for hundreds of people and is making a difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and, and so with that, and, and I was fairly vocal when I said that, now that I think about it, I, he went into his, into his office and slammed the door and I never saw him again. But I kept showing up until the last person left the company uh, because uh, I may not have owned it anymore and and whatnot, but it didn't matter. It was the, It was part of my identity, part of my heart was you know, was with that venture. Mm. And it wasn't about the money. It was about the, the spirit, the enthusiasm and the friendships and everything else. And, um, and I know that, uh, uh, George always felt that, uh, I think, I think George was fearful that the negative experience of how Koala shut down was going to affect our relationship. And I said, George, I said, are you kidding? I said, I'd start another company with you in a heartbeat. You know, um, you just say the word. And, and, and the only reason that we haven't done that is we just haven't found something that really takes advantage of both of our interests and, and, and skills in the right way. Um, and so now he's, off in his academic uh, side of things, and which is great, and uh, teaching entrepreneurship and, and whatnot in a country that's uh, very interested in the topic. So I'm thrilled for him uh, and his whole family. Um, Norma and I haven't been over to see him yet. That's you know, one of these days I'll get to that part of the world. Uh, probably a little too hot <laughs> for me to spend too much time in. But um, anyway, um, and George is still making noises about coming back to the U.S. And when he does get back here every year, uh, <clears throat> doesn't always work out, but we usually find time to get together and spend and spend some time. Uh, and in the meantime, we're talk to each other on the phone quite a bit. Nice. So, yeah, but it was quite a, uh, uh, you, you sort of learn in, in life that what you do is less important than who you do it with. And, and I, I like the example of, that I give is, is koala and, and working with George. <clears throat> and now I get to add a second one of those, having been a consultant in the intervening years, uh, with this new, new job, uh, with, uh, with polar 3d. In fact, the funny story behind that, uh, I'm 74 now and, and my wife and I were down in Brazil where we have a home. My wife's Brazilian. Uh, she's also a U.S. citizen. 
and we were talking about retiring. <clears throat> and so last August, uh, <clears throat> we're and, and we were going to retire in Brazil. And I was just about to put our U.S. house on the market. I mean, like two weeks away from doing that. And I got a phone call from this company that we'd done a little bit of work for in Cincinnati, Polar 3D. And they said, we need a director of education. And I said, well, good for you. I can give you some names. And they said, oh, we have a name. And I said, well, that's great. Thanks for calling. Bye. And they said, no, 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 don't hang up. We want it to be you. And I thought, oh, geez, you know. And, and But I like them so much and I like their product. And I thought, okay, do I have, do I have the energy to do another startup? And the answer took about 30 seconds was, yeah, I do. <laughs> because as I said, once it's in your blood, um, so I'm loving it absolutely loving it and and i have a lot of the same kind of excitement and the thing that's fun is that the two co-founders of that company uh had previous experience uh, one of them had had done a successful startup himself uh the ceo of the company uh was a former mergers and acquisitions attorney which is great because you know, once he gets the cow fattened up enough, we can sell it, right? Um, and, but he knows how to put those kinds of deals together. And uh, and the guy who invented the technology used to work for Microsoft, but he was a 3D printer buff and came up with an amazingly unique concept uh, where the printer operated using polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. And that simplified the hardware tremendously. And uh, the result is a really, really nice printer. So, uh, and then with everything else being cloud-based, it's, it's just given us a unique niche in, in the market. So um, I, th I think back so fondly on the Koala experience and the fact that I had that experience also made me valuable to that to Polar because they know that I understand what it's like working with limited resources and inventing the future, so to speak. Yeah, nice. You said before that you were disappointed at, at the relatively limited number of ways the koala pad was used. And that yet I was looking through your book and you, you kind of list the ways it is used. There's drawing programs. There were some music programs. Uh, there's uh, a couple of educational things like uh, Muppet learning keys. Right. Well, I invented Muppet learning keys also. Did you? Did you code it? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, that also, that, believe it or not, Muppet learning keys use the koala uh, technologies. And yeah. so... The underlying technology of Muppet Learning Keys was the same uh, was the same as the Koala Pad, and uh, and whatnot. So, uh, but that was uh, that was a fun project, and I did a lot of work uh, directly with Jim Henson and and with his team of people, <laughs> and so that was that was great fun. But yes, uh, Muppet Learning Keys, uh, that was that was great. I have a gadget. I just just occurred to me. I have a gadget that it's uh, not made by Koala, but it's a. It looks like a piano keyboard, um, but basically it's like a Koala pad, only slightly bigger, and and uh, looks like a piano keyboard. You can play music on it. Was that something that you guys? No, created we didn't for another company. Mm -mm. No. Uh. -uh. But um, you know, once you've got, I mean, basically, once you. Once you've got an analog XY surface, then it's just a matter of putting masks over different areas and then coding those to represent different things. And then that can become any type of keyboard that you want. Sure. And in fact, the Koala pad um, itself supported overlays. And we didn't do a lot with that, but uh, you could slip in a... a in the case itself, there's little recesses. They're kind of hard to see, but from the top, you could snap in an overlay, um, and you could create something something customized. And I think if if we did have a focus on education, that that was because that's where my heart was. Um, 
not so much that we done this extensive market research or anything of that sort. Sure. So my question was uh, going to be, um, there was educational software, drawing, music, Muppet learning, yeah. keys, that sort of thing. Um, were there any applications that other people came up with that surprised you? Not, probably, but I can't think of any right off the top of All my right. head. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You mentioned before that you did some consulting from Atari for Atari. Uh, curious about what that was, what you did for them. Yeah, I was uh, uh, when when I left before I started uh, Koala. When I left Xerox in 1981, uh, I went over to Atari and ended up being there. Oh, like three quarters time. Uh, in the personal computer division. And uh, one of the things I did while I was there, uh, again, my focus was primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on education. And uh, so I did a, uh, uh, I did a network that allowed people to load a program on multiple Atari computers at the same time. And the way it and the way it worked was, I, I used the uh, I used the uh, basically the cassette port <laughs> to uh, so that if I did a save command on one machine and everybody else was was loading, that in, in, you had to be able to say, okay, when I say. You know, when I count to three, press the key, uh, the data would go off over this over this network using parts I bought at Radio Shack and, you know, maybe a dollar's worth of hardware at each machine. And and it worked. I mean, we never productized it, but it was just a fun, a fun kind of project to do. And then I did a couple of languages for them at Atari. I did uh, um, I did Atari Pilot. Uh, which was a programming language for kids that to which I'd also added Turtle Graphics, which was an element of the Logo language. Mm -hmm. and, and I also did a lot of work with Logo itself and uh, wrote, uh, ended up writing some books on that topic for different companies, uh, machines uh, later on. But at Atari, on the commercial side, uh, we did a dedicated machine for, I want to say Citibank, uh, for electronic banking and uh, that had a built-in modem. So it was a very customized machine because uh, you remember modems from those days. Those were separate, <laughs> separate boxes. Sure. And in fact, if you've ever shown somebody an acoustic coupler <laughs> that's never seen one before, I'm sure they've asked you, what on earth is this? <laughs> and you tell them you take your telephone and you plug it in. And I've had people say, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> nope, that's how we used to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how fast did the network work? Oh, we could get all the way up to 300 baud. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> my God, I can type faster than that. I said, "Yep, yeah, you're right." Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but such is the that's what it was in those days. Um, and then uh, one of the my favorite projects at Atari, we used to get these these um, these memoranda from the military because uh, they were looking for simulators. And it was just fun to read these things. And they wanted a simulator for a tow missile. This was a tank, uh, tank launched uh, missile that was wire guided. And so I sent in a proposal that, uh, you know, hey, we could, we could, we could do that. Uh, and, and just as I sent in, Largely as a joke, but anyway, the army got back to us and said, "You know, um, we're going to be giving this contract to Singer because they're the ones who do these big uh, simulators uh, for the military stuff." But what did you have in mind? And I said, "Well, I said we could do a, a video game 
that simulates this missile and whatnot. And they said, you mean like a coin operated video game? And I said, yeah, we could do that. And they said, you know, that might be a nice thing to have because we could put that into uh, the NCO clubs. And then uh, when the military guys are going to the club for a beer, you know, they could play this game and in the process of doing it, hone their skills. And so uh, I said, well, what I'd like to do is to also do a version of this that isn't classified, <laughs> that could be just put in regular arcades. And they said, uh, OK, uh, so there were two versions. There was the one for them that I don't talk about. And then there was the version that ended up in arcades. It was called Battle Zone. And um, and Battle Zone started out just because I was a crazy person, <laughs> Atari, nice. and 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 sent in a response to a, a government proposal as a joke. Um, but it ended up being a very popular coin-operated video game. Uh, made was a money maker for Atari, so they were happy. But the only downside of it was that the the wing of the building where that was being developed, you had to have a special badge to get into. Okay. And what we would do is you, you had to take this badge out and hold it up against the wall for the card reader to read. And I thought, well, gee, you know, that's kind of a pain. I'd like this to be more like Star Trek that you just walk to it and the door just slides open. Right. So I got in and I tweaked the sensitivity on the uh, on the card reader so that you could have the card in your pocket. And then as you walk through the door, it would just shoop, slide open and then you went. Well, one night, um, unbeknownst to uh, my team, <laughs> security had come in and reset the uh, sensitivity of the door. <laughs> and one of my friends walked right into a plate glass door. Because <laughs> we were so used to this thing just <laughs> opening by itself. But um, but anyway, I worked with Atari, and then I uh, I went to Apple, uh, did some consulting for them, and and I showed them the uh, what became the Koala Pad technology. Steve Jobs contacted me and said, I, he, "He said, David, he said I'd like you to uh, develop a mouse for us." And I said, "Well, I can do better than a mouse. I can give you a tablet." So he funded it uh, for a while uh, and had me working at Apple. And then he decided he really wanted a mouse instead. So I said, OK, fine. Um, and then years later, when the Koala Pad came out as a commercial product, I saw him at the West Coast Computer Fair, I believe it was, in San Francisco. And he came over to our booth and he said, you know, he said, we were both right. Because <laughs> uh, he said, the mouse has been successful. But he said, the tablet's good, too. And whatnot, which was, from him, that was high praise. Because he was sure. not the most pleasant person in the world. Steve Wozniak, in the meantime, was a huge proponent of what we were doing. And he was one of our first paying customers, but we never cashed his check. Uh, what we did was we got when Steve Wozniak sent his check in, we shipped him a koala pad. We framed his check. I have no idea where it is today, uh, but um, it's just, you know, because we thought, man, you know, if we've gotten his attention, it must be must be pretty cool. Um, but that was uh, those were great days. Uh, they're all great days. They're great days today, too. But thinking back on those days, uh, we did things that made a difference. And that was that was great fun. Nice. Uh, so on pilot, did you work with uh, Harry Stewart? Harry Stewart, you know, that name doesn't ring a bell, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, could could well be. the My first contact with Pilot was actually from outside of uh, Atari. It was um, Dean, oh golly, he's one of the developers in the language. Um, and I've just got a block on his name right now. 
but um, but the yeah the pilot team was a uh, uh, they did some some really nice things, and in fact I helped design. There was a two page ad. Um, that was a color color ad that ran in magazines at the time. <clears throat> and it was just a bunch of screenshots of some really cool programs. <clears throat> and the message of the ad is you can do all of this and then <clears throat> a whole bunch of screenshots and then a picture of the cartridge with just this. And, and I think that was, I think that was neat. I mean, back in those days, getting kids to code was was the normal way of doing things. And yeah. the sad part today is that very few, you know, we, we live in an app generation where kids want to download software written by other people, but not necessarily write any of their own. And I think that does a disservice to us as a society. I think there's a lot of, of good things. Even if you don't become a programmer, you ought to know how to make a computer do something that maybe you and nobody else wants it to be able to do. And pilot was certainly a, a tool that lets you do that as, as was logo and some of these other uh, languages that were out at the time. But, uh, and I don't have my uh, I don't have any 800s anymore. I I don't even have any 400s left. So um, my Commodore Pet um, I just gave away. I had a, a Commodore Pet with a four-digit serial number, and as you can tell, I'm a 6502 fanatic, so <laughs> that sort of fits that whole Atari Apple Commodore sure. world. <laughs> And uh, I bought my pet from uh, Chuck Peddle, the guy who invented the 6502 chip, uh, was working at Commodore at the time. <clears throat> and uh, I had to decide, <clears throat> was I going to go with 8K uh, or 4K or 8K? And so I, I went with 8K. And then I upgraded on my own all the way to 128K of RAM. Because wow. who, who could conceivably need more than that ever, <laughs> right? Um, but I gave, that, uh, I gave that machine away. I was afraid to turn it on because of the elect electrolytic capacitors in it. And so I gave it to actually the guy who invented the Polar 3D printer, uh, who restores old machines. He's got a, oh, geez. Uh, the, he's got an Altair uh, 8080. Uh, he's got an Apple One working. Um, and he's got my Commodore Pet. And he's got a couple of other machines. Oh, the original Sinclairs. He's got some of those. He's, he's got a bunch of, of things. And the very first thing he did was he just replaced the electrolytic capacitors and then went on from there. Yeah. And the machine booted up the very first time. So that was, that was good. Yeah. A lot of those uh, folks I know who work with those old machines, they get a machine, first thing they do is recap it because they dry out, yeah. I guess. and just That's right. They do. Know. Yeah. <laughs> and and so uh, and the problem is that you can really do some damage uh, to your entire power supply board uh, if if those capacitors short out. I mean, you're going to blow out the rectifiers for sure. And, and so, yeah. Uh, also, you mentioned the, uh, the 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 computer networking system. At Atari. Yeah, uh, I believe that was called the Classroom Star. I talked to one other guy about that uh, named Mark Rustad a couple of years ago. Do you know that name? No. Uh. -uh. Well, what we did, I called it SchoolNet. Uh, this could have but, been a parallel project, or who knows? Yeah. You know. Yeah. It was just something I was just doing for fun. I mean, it was. Yeah. I did a lot of. I did a while I was at Atari. I did a lot of of, of weird things for fun. Um, I did a video game <laughs> called Fetch where you um, took a bone and you pressed a key and the bone would shoot out and then a dog would chase after it and bring it back and you get a point. And, of course, every time you <laughs> sent the bone out, the dog would bring it back. And I just did it just for fun. <laughs> and 
And lo and behold, people were having fetch competitions. <laughs> Since you can't lose the game, I mean, the dog always goes and gets the bone. What's the point? <laughs> but, uh, nice. Uh, you know, yep, well, it uh, took the place of drinking, I guess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Is there any chance that any of this software still exists? No, not the stuff I was doing. Uh -uh. Um, but the cartridge-based stuff, you probably have a good collection. I'm of sure, yeah, yourself. the cartridges are out there. I just meant the, the source code to fetch or, oh, you know, the, no. your school uh -uh. net or anything. No. Uh -uh. no. Which, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I just have a couple more questions. Um, which of the, the Qualipad versions was the, the big seller? You know, the, the Apple or the Commodore or the Atari? I actually don't know. I'm going to guess Commodore just because the Commodore 64 was such a popular machine. Yeah. And so just based on that, that would be my guess. Um, and then, uh, but other, but I actually don't know. Did George have any ideas? I didn't. I don't think I asked him that question. Yeah. Cool. So what haven't I asked you about the koala days that I should have? Uh, would I do it again? Would you do it again? Oh, yeah. In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. And, um, you know, knowing, knowing what I know now, I think I certainly would have um, worked more closely with the marketing people and worked more closely with developers to expand the tablet technology into other domains uh, besides the obvious of drawing apps and and education apps, but to take a look, for example, at, at business applications uh, and, and things of that sort. Uh, but uh, yes, I would definitely do it again. It was a, even though I didn't get any money out of it, um, it was a terrific, uh, terrific period in my life. And, and just the friendships that were forged, especially with George, um, made everything worth it. Great. Wait, wait a minute. When Koala sold, I, mean, I realized it was kind of on the decline, but that didn't make you rich? Nope. Oh, no. Uh-uh. No, no. Uh, not by a long shot. The company did not, uh, didn't make anybody rich. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it still wouldn't keep me from doing it again. I, mm. You know, obviously getting rich would have been nice. I would have liked that. But the real value of that, as I said before, is, is the connections with people. And then just being able to make something that folks have heard about. And I look at my son, who now works for Apple, but um, he's the inventor of Shazam. Uh, yeah, that was his based on his master's thesis. I used and, that twice yesterday. Okay. Well, he he did that. Um, uh, the the underlying technology of that was the basis of his master's thesis at Stanford um, University, and when the company was getting ready to get started, Harvey was in the doctoral program and didn't want to stop that. So he basically sold out his share, uh, which is was great for him. Um, and then he did another startup uh, based on his doctoral work that didn't hit profitability. It, it went belly up. Um, and then he decided to move back to the Bay Area and ended up getting hired by Apple, where he does secret stuff now for Tim Cook. And um, I, I don't know what he does because it's not my business. And uh, being an industry insider, I'm sure that he knows not to talk to his dad about too, too many things. Uh, but he's doing, he's, he's doing just great. Uh, but when in the interim, he had become a professor at ASU in uh, in Tempe, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, and uh, bought a when he bought his house, he bought his house using the money he'd gotten from Shazam. I mean, he just bought the house. 
So he did he did well, <laughs> uh, even though Shazam hadn't gone public uh, because he took cash instead of stock. And that was great for him. And I'm, I'm very proud of him. So he's he's doing fine. And uh, and now he's. He's done the opposite of his dad. I started out in the Fortune 500 company, Xerox, and then went the startup route. He did the startup route out of grad school and then ended up now with a Fortune 500 company. So he's done things backwards from his dad, but he's happy. Um, yeah, thrilled for him. Good. All right, last question. I'm going to yes. ask, ask you to send a message. Um, there were kids who, people, the children at the time who used the koala pad and now they are adults and they are listening to this interview, send them a message. Dream big dreams and don't let anybody stand in your way. Um, if you've got an idea for something um, that's going to make a difference in people's lives, You'll never regret what you did as you get older. You're, you will, however, regret what you didn't do. And so be bold. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Kevin. This has been really fun. It's been fun for me, too. Okay. Great. I'll let you know when this is published, but this is okay. perfect. This was absolutely Thank perfect. Thank you. Great. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.